Right off the bat, Netflix's sci-fi smash hit of the summer Stranger Things is just trying to balance enough sci-fi and horror. In fact, other than all the telekinesis, exploding rats, and Russian agents, there's a bunch of cool physics ideas in here too. And so it got people thinking, is the physics in Stranger Things viable in real life? Well, let's take a look to see whether the show really delivers on scientific accuracy. First off, here's what university physics professors had to say. The show's plot is typically about a group of children who spend a huge chunk of the season trying to rescue the 12-year-old Will Bryers, who's actually their friend but was kidnapped for some reason by a weird, mysterious creature. And as you keep watching, you're going to see that Byers was actually taken to a parallel universe that seems to coexist within his own world, which is actually dubbed Upside Down. Plus, there's a point of entry to the very same Upside Down, which comes from a mysterious government organization called the Hawkins National Laboratory. And the same energy department is also the actual place for some pretty cool scientific experimentation on telekinesis. Along the way, you'll also see Eleven, who actually manages to get out of the government facility and bumps into Byers' friends. Now, in all honesty, LSU's Hearn Chair of Theoretical Physics, Jorge Pullen, doesn't believe the show's as scientifically accurate as you may think. In fact, he says that the series is just trying to get on the right track, thinking that the powerful combination of electricity and energy is going to create some sort of anomaly. Here's what he thinks about the show. First off, what they're really after is the idea of black holes, where you're going to compress mass to create some sort of region in space-time where absolutely nothing can get out. Yeah, that'll be perfect for some TV entertainment, but the actual scientific concepts you see in Stranger Things, such as traveling between dimensions, aren't actually going to happen in real life. Like the presence of another universe that coexists with our world, something like what you see in the show is pretty much impossible. In fact, to actually create a black hole on Earth, you're going to need to shrink the planet to an inch in size. Now tell us yourselves how absolutely real that seems. Like, even the amount of energy needed to do that isn't even possible on Earth and is much more energetic and dense than anything traveling through a phone line. Moving on, Professor Jorge also saw a slight ray of hope in the show's attempt to be close to reality. Despite the bunch of scientific inaccuracies, he still thinks they got some decent ideas. Having said that, decent ideas don't really mean accurate because while the ideas still kind of make sense, they're still off by a huge factors and pretty far from established physics. And like Nikola Tesla once said, in order to understand the universe, we need to look at it in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. String theory is a pretty interesting concept that was also explored a bit in the famous sitcom The Big Bang Theory with the idea of super asymmetry. And think about it, what would it be like if the universe we live in was actually composed of multiple dimensions? That'd probably mean that you, us, and our part of the universe are just a small piece of the entire cake. But hey, when Stranger Things tries to explain string theory, Mr. Clark, the boy science teacher, almost got it right. All right, it's pretty simple. He uses the analogy of an acrobat on a tightrope that can only move back and forth, and the acrobat can only see three dimensions. With that said, a flea on the tightrope can travel all around the rope, so it's going to be moving in the regular three dimensions and a few extra ones. Pretty cool, right? Let's dig into this analogy further with theoretical physicist Paul Steinhardt. All right, so credits where it's due. Paul beautifully explained the acrobat flea analogy in a slightly different way. So picture this. The acrobat's walking along the tightrope, and the acrobat's absolutely huge, trying to balance herself on the skinny rope. So she's going to see the rope as a one-dimensional line, where she can move back and forth on this thin surface. She's never going to walk around the circular direction of the rope, mostly because she'd fall off, and she's probably too big for it. Anyway, a flea walking on the very same rope is going to do whatever it wants. Now, it can go back and forth, or even around the rope. And if it's feeling more hyped than usual, then maybe even crawl down the side of the rope. Now, that is a great way to imagine string theory that basically talks about extra dimensions curled up into little balls. And creatures are much bigger than the balls and can only move in three dimensions. But some very teeny weeny particles are going to squeeze their way through the three dimensions and explore a bunch of extra dimensions. Having said that, let's talk about some more specific examples from Stranger Things. First up, we're going to start with falling magnets. It's raining magnets? No, hold up. It's just some basic physics with fridge magnets. So when Joyce Byer starts to notice that her fridge magnets are starting to fall off her fridge, she just knows something weird's going on. So she goes to the science teacher, Scott Clark. Yeah, the dude who crushed it when he explained string theory. Definitely, he's got a pretty scientific explanation for this too. He demonstrates how if you pass a current through a coil of wire, which is called a solenoid, it's going to create a magnetic field. And when he turns off the current, the magnets attached to the solenoid are simply going to fall to the ground. In the same way, a strong external magnetic field was probably the reason why Joyce's magnets lost their attraction. So 
Joyce's quest is to somehow find the source of this magnetic interference. Honestly, Mr. Clark's explanation isn't exactly spot on, but definitely plausible to some extent, but he isn't telling us the whole story. Permanent magnets actually work when the magnetic poles of all the atoms are pointing in the same direction. So if you want to demagnetize a magnet, you're going to need to jiggle the atoms around until they're no longer pointing in the same way. Now that's done with heat or by passing alternating current through a solenoid, which in turn will create a varying external magnetic field. Now that's what Mr. Clark talks about. He says creating a field that'll cover the entire town would need a pretty humongous machine. But what he misses out on is that such a large magnetic field is also going to disrupt anything that uses electricity in the town. So falling fridge magnets are pretty far from the only noticeable effect of the machine. Next up, the parallel universes that got a bunch of people interested in the first place. Now there's a major theme of the show, the parallel universe, aka upside down. And here's the catch, it looks almost identical to our actual universe, except that it's darker, horrifying, creepier, and home to some weird alien monsters ruled by the Mind Flayer. Now, this show talks about parallel universes and alternate dimensions as interchangeable terms, which in itself is incorrect because they're two very different concepts. While Upside Down is definitely a parallel universe, dimensions are nothing more than directions in space or time. And again, we jump in with the concept of string theory, where we talk about extra dimensions, not universes. Somewhere in the show, Mr. Clark also dimensions Hugh Everett's Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, where there are many parallel universes that are just like our world, but think about infinite variations. And that's an entirely different idea to having extra dimensions. We're not going to jump in with some college-level physics, but just move on to when Mr. Clark talks about the possibility of traveling between parallel universes. So that's like folding a piece of paper in half and stabbing a pen through both sides, but replace paper with universes, and you're going to need a massive amount of energy. What he's basically talking about is a wormhole, which is simply a bridge between two distant parts of space-time. Right now, they're just a theory, and scientists argue about its possibility. But even if it was like Mr. Clark said, we'd need an incredible amount of energy. Moving on, the most debatable reference of the show, Planck's Constant. Another season, another physics reference. Now, Planck's Constant was the code used by Russians in their secret lab. Now, we're not going to bring out a chalkboard here and start writing equations, but just know the basics. Planck's Constant is denoted by the letter H. It's basically a number that's found everywhere in quantum mechanics, and it's a ridiculously small number. Anyway, in the show, you're going to see a slight problem with the number the show's going to quote as Planck's constant. As the scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. pointed out, the number used in Stranger Things was actually the accepted value back in 2014, but the show wasn't set in 2014. It was set in 1985, and the value for Planck's constant back then was slightly different. So does that mean the Stranger Things characters were ahead of their time, or did the directors and writers miss out on the accuracies? So, the moral of the story? Just don't misquote your constants, because physicists are the most pedantic people in the world. That's a wrap for this video. How close do you think the physics in Stranger Things is close to reality? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one.